late last week, there was an editorial published in PLOS, Neglected Tropical Diseases, titled An Unfolding Tragedy of Chagas Disease in North America, which put the preliminary estimates of the parasitic infection, Chagas disease, at somewhere, re somewhere between one and a half to seven million people infected in North America. Joining me on the phone is Dr. Peter Hotez. Dr. Hotez is the president of the Sabin Vaccine Institute and the founding dean of the National School of Tropical Medicine at the Baylor College of Medicine. Hello, Dr. Hotez, and thanks for spending the time to talk with me. Oh, great. Thank you for having me. Great. Uh, before we get into the meat of your editorial, can you please explain to my radio audience what Chagas disease is, how you can track it, and the general pathology of this parasitic disease? Sure. So Chagas disease is a cause of serious heart disease. It's a disease that's actually extremely common in the Western Hemisphere and an important cause of heart disease, but not many people are aware of it or know much about it. It's a parasitic infection. It's caused by a small uh, microscopic parasite known as a trypanosome that has the ability to live inside the human heart. And the way people get it is uh, when they're attacked by a uh, bug about the size of a cockroach, which goes by different names. Some people call them kissing bugs, other assassin bugs, other vinchucas, uh, chichos. There's a, there's a number of uh, different colloquial names, and it's fairly well known among the poorest parts of uh, Latin America. Great. Now, of course, Chagas is well documented to be a scourge in um, parts of South America. Uh, the World Health Organization estimates about 7 to 8 million people are infected. However, in your editorial, you place the estimates on the numbers in North America really pretty high. And I, I'm going to quote, in the U.S., approximately 300,000 cases are believed to be present, although one alternative estimate reports more than a quarter of, of a million cases in Texas alone with up to 1 million or more cases nationwide pretty big numbers. So since Chagas is linked to poverty, poor housing, and the like, where are these 300,000 to 1 million people found in the United States? Well, so let's take a step back. So first of all, you know, the World Health Organization and others say 7 to 8 million cases. We really don't know. I mean, this is what we call a neglected tropical disease, uh, emphasizing the neglected part. These are a, a parasite that occurs among the poorest of the poor, uh, living uh, in, the, in the Western Hemisphere. So there's about 120 million people in the Western Hemisphere that live on less than $2 a day. And the link with poverty, we're still trying to work it out. It has to do with the fact that poor quality dwellings, so the, the bugs have the ability to live inside the house or invade houses. And I think that has something to do with it. So let's talk a little, let's shift now to the U.S. Well, it turns out the United States has poor people, uh, and some of the new poverty figures are pretty striking. So what it means is we have 20 million Americans now, people in the U.S., living uh, uh, in what's called extreme poverty. That means half the national poverty level. And the even more frightening number is now around 4 to 5 million Americans in the U.S. live on less than $2 a day. So 1.6 five million families living on less than two dollars a day and and the poverty is not distributed equally across the United States it's concentrated in the southern US particularly in Texas and particularly in the Gulf Coast and what we're seeing now with poverty in the Gulf Coast and in, in Texas are cases of people uh, with Chagas disease and it's not all being imported from Mexico and El Salvador and places like that there's actually evidence for transmission of this disease uh, within the U.S. Right. As a matter of fact, I interviewed somebody from the San Antonio Humane Society a few weeks ago uh, concerning several cases of dogs with Chagas disease in that area of the country. Yeah, and it's not, it's not just several cases. Uh, you know, some studies suggest that 10% of the dogs in Texas are infected with uh, Chagas disease. Oh, so uh, this is, uh, and, and in fact, the veterinarians know more about this infection than most physicians do. So a lot of physicians are not being educated uh, about the, uh, this disease. So what's happening is that they're getting, people with Chagas disease are getting misdiagnosed. Somebody will come in with signs 
signs and signs and symptoms of heart disease, and the physician or the nurse will not even think about a nurse practitioner will not even think about uh, doing a diagnostic test for Chagas disease. So a lot of cases are being missed, and we have anecdotal reports of people getting picked up for blood screening because they've donated attempted to donate blood. They're told they have uh, may have Chagas disease. They, these individuals go to their physician, and the physician says, "Don't worry, we don't have that disease here here in the U.S. It must be a false positive." So we have a lot of awareness uh, that uh, raising that an advocacy that needs to be done. Yeah, it sounds like it. Any idea how many people in the U.S. are actually battling with chronic Chagas? You know, the cardiac issues, megacolon, et cetera. Well, I th we tend to think that the and this is still very. Uh, still not well established, but that, you know, there seems to be some v regional variation on the signs and symptoms of Chagas disease. So the kind that's up here in this part of the world is a little different from deeper down in South America, and that you have more heart disease than gastrointestinal disease up here. So it's more heart disease. You know, the, the Center for Disease Control numbers, the, one, the ones that they publish are 300,000. Uh, that could be correct, but there are other numbers out there that say that there could be almost as many as that people alone in, in just in Texas. And there's also a huge economic uh, burden. We've just done a study now with uh, Bruce Lee. No, not that Bruce Lee, a different Bruce Lee, uh, who's now at uh, Professor Johns Hopkins in the, in the Bloomberg School of Hygiene and Public Health, suggesting that uh, the Chagas disease is responsible for almost a billion dollars in health care costs uh, each year in the United States alone, and a lot of that is probably, most of that's concentrated almost certainly in Texas and the Gulf Coast. Right. Now, now immigration has to be a big factor, and how much of a factor is immigration on Chagas disease in the United States today? Well, I don't think we really know, uh, and you know, you have to be very careful when you talk about these neglected tropical diseases because the, one of the first things that happens is the anti-immigrant blogs light up and, you know, start saying, see, we got to build the wall higher. Uh, right. I try to emphasize the fact that, you know, the dogs who are infected didn't come and slip in from Mexico and El Salvador. Uh, they've been here a long time. In fact, there's some studies that suggest that you can find evidence of Chagas disease and mummified remains in the Rio Grande Valley for, from a thousand years ago. So I, I I think, and we don't have the evidence yet to really support it, so it's more speculation on my part, but for everything I can tell, I think this disease has in, has been in the United States a long, long time, and while immigration is a component, it, it, it may very well not be the major component, that there's a lot of transmission that's just not being picked up in the U.S. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, one of the more disturbing numbers you write about is the number of pregnant women in North America infected. And I believe you said 40,000 by some yeah. estimates. Yeah, this is a number that of a study led by my friend and colleague, Pierre Bukins, who's the my counterpart at Tulane University, the dean there. And he's uh, come up with uh, that there's 40,000 pregnant women in North America, that includes Mexico, but also the United States, uh, that are infected with Chagas disease. And there's two problems with that. One, uh, around 5% of the time, those mothers will pass the infection onto their babies. So they're born with congenital Chagas disease. The other problem is we have no medicines for pregnant women. So there are no medicines that are available that you could safely use in pregnancy to treat Chagas disease. We have absolutely nothing to offer them. And uh, this is... Uh, really creating uh, quite a severe situation. The one we're trying to address now, we're actually trying to make a vaccine for Chagas disease to be able to use in such individuals. Okay, great. Now, you also mentioned that our neighbors to the south, Mexico, uh, the third most, um, the number three country with Chagas. What's, what's number one and two, Brazil and Brazil and Argentina seem to be at the, at the top of the list, uh, but uh, Mexico is a number three. And you know, just as the just as the disease is being neglected here in the U.S., it's also sadly being neglected in Mexico. So there's uh, it's very difficult to have access to any medicines for Chagas disease. There's not a lot of active surveillance is being done. So we have a we have a in this sense we have a real problem with raising awareness of the disease on both sides of the border. 
Yeah, the, these estimates that you put in, into this editorial are really astounding, I think. Well, they're astounding, but also if you look at the range, it's 1 to 6 million. Well, in, in Mexico, well, there's a lot of difference between 1 and 6 million. So sure. we got, we've got to get our arms around this. And, and the same in the yeah. U.S. We've got 0 0.3 to more than 1 million. Well, there's a big difference between those two numbers, so we've got to right. get our arms it's around that as well. Your, it's hard to picture the United States having one million people with Chavez. You know, there's a, there's there's a so lot. There's, 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 as, I mean, and we're finding it under some on some unexpected populations too. So, sure. you know, there's a lot of poverty in the U.S. And uh, you know, yeah. although it's the wealthiest country on earth, we have a huge disparity. I mean, there's a number out there called the Gini coefficient. It's, it's a term the economists use to describe the difference between uh, the disparity in wealth. And poverty in a country, and the higher the Gini coefficient is, the higher your disparity is. Well, in Texas, the Gini coefficient is the same as Nepal. So, uh, meaning there's a there's a, you know you're either wealthy or you're not, and and the have-nots are at very much very much at risk for this disease. Yeah, I, I can remember graduate parasitology, and it was the picture I always have in my head is the thatch huts down near the Amazon. Yeah, near, like, yeah. Um, how is the medical and public health establishment dealing with and preparing for Chagas in the United States? Because clearly there's an issue with physicians knowing next to nothing about Chagas, uh, laboratory testing probably. It, it, it's it's not. So the, uh, you know, we have some really great leadership in the Department of Health and Human Services here uh, in, in the United States. Uh, uh, both at the NIH and CDC, and but they're still getting their arms around how to, you know, grapple with the problem of this disease uh, in the United States. We 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 seem to do a better job with imaginary pathogens like H5N1 flu and smallpox and anthrax. So we figured out how to how to combat the imaginary diseases, <laughs> but the neglected, but you know, ironically, the neglected tropical diseases, which are not rare infections, are very common. Just they're m m mostly occurring among the poor. We still have a ways to go in figuring out how to handle it. And earlier in our talk, you discussed about treatment, and there's no FDA-approved um, uh, drug for Chavez. Um, what, what's the status on treatment? Well, there are two drugs that you can obtain from the Center for Disease Control um, if you're found to be positive for Chagas, but it's not easily available. I mean, the problem is the diagnostic tests are not easily available, the physician awareness is not, not high, so you've got a huge number of people not being diagnosed. The medicines are not easily available, and even when they are available, they're bad medicines in the sense that they're very toxic. Uh, a significant percentage of the time, the med they require long treatment courses, a significant percentage of the time the patient can't tolerate the full treatment course and has to prematurely interrupt uh, treatment because of all the toxicities. There, there's blood toxicities and skin rashes and a uh, number of other uh, problems. So we don't have a lot to offer. And oftentimes by the time the heart disease starts, it's too late. So we don't have a right. lot to offer. Now, I I've even been so provocative as to uh, make a comparison between the current situation we have with Chagas disease and what uh, it was like with HIV AIDS in the early part of the epidemic when we didn't have good, good medicines, we didn't have good diagnostic tests, we had a lot of cases during pregnancy and being passed on to the baby and not much we could do. And so there's an eerie comparison in my view, although uh, I've written about this and some of the people in the AIDS community have, have not been happy with that because they, they point out there are a lot of, dis there are a lot of dissimilarities as well and I, and I absolutely agree with that. Um, you kind of discussed about a preventive vaccine. What, what's in the pipeline? Well, we're, initially we're proposing as a therapeutic vaccine, almost like an immunotherapy to be used alongside existing medicines. And this is being done in our laboratories, which are which are called the Sabin Vaccine Institute and Texas Children's Hospital uh, Center for Vaccine Development. Uh, we've got, uh, we're doing this in collaboration with a colleague in Mexico, Dr. Eric Dumontiel, and um, we're advancing uh, these vaccines to the point where we can uh, get them manufactured uh, 
uh, and then submit uh, regula for regulatory approval to begin some phase one clinical trials uh, in a few years. So we're still a few years away, but we're pretty excited about the prospect of making the first therapeutic vaccine for Chagas disease. Okay. And um, in your opinion, um, are, are we to expect higher numbers of Chagas in the future, or, or are we getting a handle on this? Well, that's a good question. And, you know, that's so as people ask me, is this an emerging infection? Are we seeing an explosion in the number of cases? And I really can't answer that because no one was ever looking. So I can't even say whether this is a new problem or whether it's an old problem. We're just picking it up now because we're taking the time to look. And I have a feeling it's the latter, that this, that this disease has been around a long time. Uh, but um, that, that's an important question. Is, are the numbers on the rise or are they what they've always been? Okay. Um, now, you might say that's pretty astonishing that something that affects that many people and causes severe heart disease could be missed for so long. But this is a paradigm that we're seeing over and over again with neglected tropical diseases in the U.S. Sure. You know, we were finding, you know, the evidence that we've had dengue transmission in Houston for at least a decade that we're only finding about now. Or we have 2.8 million African Americans with a worm infection on this toxicoriasis that nobody's aware of. So this seems to be a common uh, paradigm. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, Dr. Hotez, can you, I'm going to go ahead and give you a minute or two to go ahead and promote some of these things you're doing. Uh, the Sabin Vaccine Institute and the National School of Tropical Medicine. Uh, right. So, so we've uh, we've uh, we've uh, two years ago moved the laboratories of the Sabin Vaccine Institute from Washington, D.C. to become uh, linked with Texas Children's Hospital, which in turn uh, is part of a larger uh, enterprise known as the National School of Tropical Medicine at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston. It's part of the Texas Medical Center. So this would be one of the uh, uh, first uh, comprehensive schools exclusively devoted to the kinds of tropical infections uh, that we've been uh, talking about talking about today. And it has a, a strong research mission to make new vaccines and to conduct uh, uh, studies among populations here in the U.S. and abroad. It has a clinic. Uh, we have what we think is the first tropical medicine clinic uh, in the U.S., which is a, a, happens every Friday. We have people coming in with these diseases. It's not a traveler's clinic. It's actually people with these infections who are now being picked up and now coming to our clinic on uh, Friday mornings. Uh, we have an education program to provide a uh, advanced training for physicians who want to learn more about these diseases called a diploma in tropical medicine, as well as some new uh, undergraduate courses because global health is a hot topic among young people these days and a really unusual commitment to public service. And we also do a lot of policy that needs to be developed. You know, what's the policy around these diseases? How, how do we get these uh, neglected tropical diseases to the attention of policymakers in the U.S. government, to the Senate, and the, and the, and the House of Representatives, and the Office of the President? So there's a that's that's an important uh, element as well. You, you're, just quickly, you were talking about the Friday Clinic. What are you seeing? Well, we're seeing Chagas disease. We're uh, seeing cystocercosis, which is a brain parasitic uh, infection. Uh, it's an important cause of epilepsy uh, here in Houston and in Texas. We're seeing a disease called cutaneous uh, leishmaniasis, which is a disfiguring uh, infection of the skin. Uh, uh, that's found in Texas, but also it's a, it occurs commonly uh, throughout uh, Central America and, uh, and South America. Uh, we're seeing uh, unusual disseminated forms of tuberculosis, uh, and so we're, we're, it's impressive to see the number and the, the spectrum of the diseases that are uh, here in our communities. Well, that's, that's very, very interesting. Well, I'm going to have to close now. Um, I've been talking to Dr. Peter Hotez, um, president of Sabin Vaccine Institute and uh, the founding dean of the National School of Tropical Medicine at Baylor. Uh, Dr. Hotez, thanks a lot for spending the time with me, and um, I hope I can have you on again sometime. Uh, thank you. Anytime, and I really appreciate your giving attention to this uh, issue and taking the end part out of the, out of the NTDs.
No problem. All right, I'll be talking to you again. All the best. Take care. Bye-bye.